my first thought was the Presbyterian rag because it fitted so nicely. But I looked up Presbyterianism and they don't really have too much to go on. And the Catholic rag was, or the Roman Catholic rag, that was just too upfront. And then I thought, oh, the Vatican rag, that's pretty good. It, it, it's very clear what the target is without actually coming out and, and saying it. It shouldn't offend anybody. I did get occasional mail and there were objections and one teacher somewhere was fired for playing it in the class and there was a big to-do. This was a long time ago. Now my feeling about religion is summed up by James Taylor's quote, which is, you can believe it if it helps you to sleep. That's my only criterion. I'm not going to interfere with anybody who wants to believe in any religion so long as they don't hurt me. And my view about religion is that it's all nonsense. I actually wrote that many years before I recorded it. Fortunately, they added some more elements and renamed some, like uh, Columbium became Niobium and things like that. And so I was able to incorporate that. So the song is accurate as of 1959, but that was over 50 years ago. But even so, a lot of the new elements have not been named yet. They just have ten temporary names while every, everybody fights it out. I started to say, well, what, can, what tune can I use? And I thought, well, Gilbert and Sullivan have already done it. In fact, there are three Gilbert and Sullivan songs which I auditioned for this. And there's one from Rudigor. My eyes are fairly open to my awful situation. I shall go and once to write a Rick and offer him, and so on. And that fits too. But I thought the, the Major General song is much better known than all of those. And so I, I settled on that one. People say, oh, it's the setting of the periodic table, which of course it isn't because the periodic table is organized in a quite a different manner. I was trying to get as many alliterations as possible to make it easier to memorize. It took me a long time, I can tell you. You know Daniel Radcliffe, another one of my heroes. You, you know the clip that, that, that's, that is involved here from the Graham Norton show, which is, on, on you, the last time I checked, it had over four million hits, his, his version of it. As you can imagine, that's a very hard song to learn. It takes a lot of time to do it the way he did, which is without cue cards and without taping and editing and whatever it is, just out, out like that, live. So I asked him, how did he find the time to learn that? And he told me that he was in Equus in London, and the last scene of Equus, he's on the floor, and the doctor throws a blanket over him and does his last monologue. So he's just got to lie there, and that's the end of the play. And he said he used that time to go over the elements. <laughs> so I was very flattered and thrilled and delighted. I wrote it long before I made my first record. I never thought to put it on the first record. Uh, I was just for around the, around the campus. Then I decided when I made the second record, well, well, might as well. And now all these years later, it, it turns out to be, I think, my most performed song, if you count all possible performances, including classroom uh, playing, playing the record. So, who knew? I never thought of it as any possibility of spreading. But it did, and it took a long time. I say it spread like herpes, not Ebola. I went into the Army for two years, the United States Army, I hasten to add, and uh, America is free today, so I rest my case. When I thought about it, I was in the Army, and I thought, uh, we're, we're hearing all about this nuclear stuff. And all, at the time, I certainly did not think that, no matter how crazy politicians were, that they would go so far as to do this and blow up the whole world. I did, really didn't think that was going to happen. They were making the first atomic bomb. I was well aware of what was going on. And uh, people said, well, how could you do that? They were doing making bombs there. And I said, well, it, the situation was somewhat different then. And the tune was supposed to be a lively, up-tempo, and it was, thing about it. Isn't that nice? You know, It's not saying, isn't it terrible that we're all going to go together? No, I say, oh, that's fine. When I did the orchestral version, I went into the studio there to do it. And the, the, the copyist arrived at the last minute with the parts and passed them around to the band, to the small band. And of course, there was no title on it, and there was no lyrics. And so they ran through it. What a pleasant little waltz. And then the conductor, Richard Heyman, said, OK, Tom, you can go into the booth. And I went in, and the engineer said, poisoning pigeons in the park, take one. And the piano player said, what? And literally fell off the stool. In Australia, the head of the Boy Scouts decided this was not a good idea. This was disrespectful to the Boy Scouts. And there were several other songs that some other people objected to, so they banned my record. But the way they banned it was they got the customs department prohibited from being imported. So that was raised, a question was raised in Parliament about this. The Prime Minister, Mr. Menzies, was asked what he thought, and he'd never heard of me, so. And then eventually, of course, uh, there was some protest, I suppose, and the record company protested. And finally, 
it got banned in several Australian states, including Queensland and Victoria, which, of course, was silly because you could just order it from Sydney, and Sydney was a much more enlightened uh, community. So, uh, so eventually, there, there was no problem. But even even so, when I did concerts in Queensland, they said, "No, you can't sing that song." Yeah, there was never any problem because, it, well, it was not a mass kind of. Nobody played my record on the radio hard, hardly ever, and uh, it didn't get around. There wasn't there wasn't a controversy at all because it was uh, nobody nobody knew about it. it. It was a cult thing for a long time. Even when it was selling well, everybody I think thought because there was little cells in each university town thought, "Well, we get it, but they won't get it." And I think, in fact, that's that. There's something about satire in general. Satire is about them. <laughs> People say, "Oh, you should write a song making fun of da 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 da." And I say, yeah, it's, it's them. How about if I make a song making fun of you? Oh, no, 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 we don't. I only did those songs at the Hungry Eye for a few weeks uh, to, to get the record. To, to, I, I've long since learned you don't. If the song goes over well with your friends at a party, that doesn't mean <laughs> that it's good. You've got to do it for a paying audience. But these were written for, uh, that was the week that was, the American version, about something that had happened that week. All the more amazing, they're still around. That's really dated. Well, particularly because it's the Marines. But the idea that whenever there's any problem... Uh, in fact, I was very flattered once on some NPR program where they played it, and then they just said that was written by Tom Lehrer in 1965. No, no further comment. Enough said. A friend of mine once said, always predict the worst and you'll be hailed as a prophet. Bing Crosby sang it on television. Imagine that. Apparently it was a very quick study. He just, he just put the song in front of him and he sings. So he sang it on his show, which called The Hollywood Palace. But ABC, who produced the show, called me and said it has the word crud in it and we don't want to use that word. Imagine that. They couldn't say crud on television and how far we've come. And uh, could they change it? And they wrote some other lines. And I said, if Bing Crosby wants to sing one of my songs, he can change anything he wants. I, I wasn't trying to, to say that this is wrong. And I'm here to tell you, I'm here to... to give you the benefit of my sage wisdom. And, and Lenny Bruce was, real, was outraged it was, uh, at what was going on. But he was very funny, though. That, that's the difference. So when he got angry, uh, then that, it's, it's, it wasn't so funny anymore. There's a quote, which I had totally forgotten until uh, Sheridan Morley, who I met many, many years later, said that, that I had said that, uh, which was that the political satire became obsolete when Henry Kissinger was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. That's totally false, by the way, because I quit before that. Satire is not dead, but deft satire is dying. <laughs> One of the differences is I used to read the headlines in the paper and, and laugh. As, oh, this isn't that ridiculous. Now I just get angry. And I think you can't be funny and angry at the same time. At the time, if I thought of something, then I wrote it. And if I didn't think of something, so that, that distinguishes me from all other songwriters because all the other songwriters I know or know of, well, it's time to write a song today. I will sit down and do that, and I will do that. And I was if I thought of it something, I would do it, and if I didn't, I didn't, and now I don't. People have said, <laughs> somebody said to me once, you're a knocker, not a booster. And most of my songs are against something, so they're very few songs that are for something like smut or mathematics. Uh, no, my feeling is that music is the most abstract of the arts. That is, anybody can, can do it. it and, and math is the most abstract. And I don't even consider, I was going to say sciences, but math, is, I don't consider math a science. Science has to do with the real world, quasars and DNA and stuff like that. Mathematics is, you can, you can make it up out of your head. And the proof is that there are prodigies in math, but there are no prodigies in physics or chemistry or biology. And there are prodigies in music, but there are no prodigies in writing or painting or any of those. In other words, these are things that you could grow up in a cabin in Montana and come up with math and come up with music, but you couldn't do the others without having some experience with the, with the real world and what other people are doing. I'm a left brain person, so in case you hadn't noticed. And so the logical uh, aspects of music, of music, of songs too, it's, it's a puzzle. You can't just put out a whole lot of notes. It, it's, got a, it's very, very constrained. Harmony, harmony, melody, rhythm, all of those things all have to fit together. And I like crossword puzzles and puzzles of all kind. I'd like to think I have that in common with Mr. Sondheim. It's fun to see if you can satisfy all these constraints, the, the meter and the rhyme and, and, and let the, the prosody, let the accent, accents fall. Uh, I saw him briefly 
it, when Follies was in Boston, and I saw him and I just said hello, and that was the end of that. But then, when Cameron McIntosh had his apotheosis there, and, and I showed up, and then, then we had lunch and could reminisce about the good old days <laughs> at Camp Andros Scott. I'm very proud, by the way, of the fact that there's a rap artist, they're not singers, they don't call them singers, they call them rap artists, uh, who, who sampled my song. 60 years later, literally 60 years after I recorded it, as we say in California, whatever. I can say that in Latin, by the way, quot cumque. And uh, I said, as sole copyright owner of the old dope peddler, I grant you mother's permission to, which is the word that they use constantly, uh, permission to do this. And uh, please give my regards to Mr. James, or may I call him too.